Okay, I'm reading first, two readings this morning. First from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 62. I'm, I'm just reading from the first, just these first five verses. Now keep in mind the context of here. Israel is desolated. Israel is, all its glory is gone. It's just languishing under being exiled and suffer the consequences of, um, of, of all their sin and all their disobedience. And into that, Isaiah, the same prophet who warned them of God's judgment if they didn't repent many times, says this. He says, For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And let's next hear this, these next words. These are from Luke chapter 4, reading from verse 14. And this is just after Jesus has been tempted in the desert and he begins his ministry. And we read this. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And this is what was written and this is what he read. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. And when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. None of them were cleansed, but only Naaman of the Syrian. And when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, that they may throw him off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. What's all that about? If I've uh, got a title for this sermon, it's Breaking Free of the Hometown Mindset. 
<laughs> you like that hand? Whoa, I'm, in, I'm encouraged already and I've only just began. Oh. <laughs> but I want to go back to that word from the prophet Isaiah. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. His word to them that all nations will see your righteousness, all the kings your glory. They weren't feeling or experiencing glory at that time, anything but that. And here he is saying, you'll be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord. You won't be termed forsaken anymore. But that's how they felt, forsaken, defeated. That was the mentality. That was the mindset. And he said, no, you will no longer be known as forsaken. Your land will no longer be known as desolate. You will be called my delight is in her. And that beautiful imagery of the bridegroom and the bride, which is uh, such an image of the, the church as the, the, the bride and Jesus the bridegroom. So he is saying the mess, the desolation, the pathetic state that you're languishing now is not the last word. There is still hope. The question is, how did Israel get into the mess? They got into that mess because they never fully embraced their calling to be a light to the nations. Isaiah 49, 6, I will make you, this is the Lord speaking to them, I will make you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That was the vision in the heart of God for Israel. That was the hope that God had. That was the reason he called this nation out from among the other nations that they not that they may be his special one and everyone else can go to hell, but rather that he would raise them up that that they would be a light to the nations, that his salvation would extend to all people. That was always in the heart of God. That's why God would call them. And that's why Isaiah says with such conviction, I will not keep silent because the word of the Lord never returns empty. That will still be fulfilled. But why did this happen? Why did this happen? They'd lost sight of who they were called to be. They'd fallen to, it's just us. You can, I guess you could say the home country, the home nation mentality. It's all about us. God bless us. We're the favoured ones. They turned what was a vision, an outward vision, into an external one where it was all about God blessing us. They took for granted the grace and love and faithfulness of God. Yeah, it's okay if we worship other gods. If It's okay if we ignore the poor, the widows, the orphans and that and just look after us. But God will look after us because he's blessed us. He's chosen us. And it was that that got them to the stage where they moved beyond the protection of his love and suffered the consequences. But Isaiah had no idea what he was saying here. He had no idea what he was saying when he prophesied to say, you shall be a light to the nations again. You shall be that which will be glory among the nations again. But by the time that in the fullness of time, when the kingdom of God came to earth in Jesus... Israel was still in that mindset. They still didn't get it. We just celebrated Christmas, the coming of Jesus, the decisive event when the kingdom of God was now not up there, not something external, but the kingdom of God in the person of Jesus was now on earth, God among us. This is what they'd been hoping for. This is what they'd been praying for. This is what they'd been longing for. This is what the prophets have been saying that would happen for hundreds of years. But when the kingdom of God was among them, they didn't recognise it. They didn't recognise Jesus. So with that background in mind, let's just look at what happened here in Nazareth, where, as I said, the hometown mindset prevailed again. 
So what do we read? We read that Jesus, after tempted by the devil, he started working. He went through Galilee and was um, clearly working signs and miracles there, at least at Capernaum and other places. And they clearly heard about it in his hometown of Nazareth. Isn't it interesting? Even though there was no internet, even though there was no television, there wasn't even newspapers, word still spread. And so here was Jesus, the one they'd been hearing about. They'd been hearing about these miracles. They'd been hearing about these healings. And here he was in his hometown. Maybe some of them were a bit miffed that he didn't begin to do it in his hometown. But at least he was here now. But let's look at what's going on. Why did they start so pleased and why did they suddenly become so outraged? So he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and he clearly, when he was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, it was no coincidence that he read those words from Isaiah 60, what we now know as Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set free those who are pro- uh, oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. The year of the Lord's favour was the jubilee year, the 50th year, we know from Leviticus. And Jesus is saying, you know, when they come into the kingdom of God, every year is a jubilee year. He said, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And they were initially very pleased when he said that. But you see, they didn't get it. Now, this is just all conjecture, what I'm going to do now, because this is not in Scripture, but, but let's just sort of imagine what might be the backstory of what was really going on here. Here they are, all glowing, but Jesus knew they didn't get it. It's like he was saying, no, 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 when he saw them all pleased, he says, no, 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 you don't get this. You see, what I'm saying is the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And they say, yes, yes, we get it. We've heard you've been healing people. You could have started here, but you didn't. But we're pleased, so just, just get on with it. Just come on, we want to see this. No, 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 you don't understand. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to all poor. Liberty to all captives. Recovery of sight to all blind. Liberty to all who oppress. Yes, yes, we get that. Not just in Nazareth, to all of us in Israel. So let's get on with it. Okay. So now he had to really come in and this is where it got heavy. What he was saying here is, okay, let's go to the great prophet Elijah. So if you think it's all about Israel, how come there were many widows in Israel and Elijah was sent to none of them he goes to one in Zarephath in the land of Sidon now just to give you that area is now what is in what is now Lebanon today so right outside of Israel Lebanon of all places (laughs) yeah (laughs) and he healed not only that he goes to a widow here and raises her son's dead but none in precious Israel and what about Elijah in fact it was it was cursed with drought and here he goes her healing and raising from the dead the son of a widow in a cursed, ungodly, apostate nation. <gasps> and then what about Elisha? There was no many lepers in Israel. None of them were cleansed. He chose a Syrian to cleanse. Can you understand now why they were so offended, why this was doing their head in? He wasn't, they weren't getting it. The kingdom of God had not come for their little precious hometown in their little nation. The kingdom of God had come for all people. Go one is excluded from the love of God. That's what Jesus was trying to say. But they were so blinded, their mindset was so closed that they couldn't get it. That's why they were so offended. That's why they wanted to throw him off a cliff. He was speaking heresy. But in their minds, God's going to look after us to heck with the rest of them. And he's, he's saying, no, I have come to preach good news to all who are poor and oppressed throughout the world. But they were bound by this hometown mindset. They were bound by their own religious traditions. 
the safety of the bless me God because I'm favoured, I'm blessed. They couldn't hear or see. Their hearts were not open to the revelation that God was doing something so much bigger as we started singing today. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. That was in the Old Testament hymn book. They would have said that in their worship. They would have declared those verses. But in practice, that love that reaches to the heavens was focused on Israel alone. And Jesus, in bringing the kingdom of God to earth, was saying, no, no, no one, no one is excluded from the love of God. The radical inclusiveness of the gospel, which goes against the grain of fallen human thinking that was in the heart of God friends from the very beginning of time what did God say let's go back to the very beginning let's go back to Genesis when God created man and woman what did he say be fruitful multiply multiply fill the earth and subdue it he was sending them out to the whole earth But see, after the fall, that's part of what we struggle with. The heart of God for his people is a sending out. But in our sinful humanity, we want to hang on. We saw that in Genesis 11, the story of the Tower of Babel. Come, let us build a tower that we can reach to the heavens. Why? And the words are, lest we be scattered over the whole earth. Direct disobedience to the command, fill the earth and subdue it. And we've been battling that ever since. And still do. And what Jesus was doing here is breaking the hometown mindset. And he battled that with Israel all the way to the cross. And remember that powerful image when Jesus breathed his last on the cross? The curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That was the temple only that where the, that separated the Holy of Holies where it was said the presence of God dwelt and only the high priest could go there and even there only one day, the day of atonement. That curtain was ripped open. What a powerful, a prophetic sign. No one is excluded from the love and grace of God. What, how God, might God, the Spirit of God, be breathing revelation into this today? Friends, I believe the biggest challenge for the church and particularly the Western church throughout the world is not succumbing to that same hometown mindset where it's about us, blessing us, but assuring we keep the kingdom vision that Jesus gave us. And etched into our hearts when he said, go and make disciples of all nations. And as we, as PCC, head into this year, 2019, as a year of prayer and discernment, looking to the future, my encouragement is that we keep a kingdom mindset, an out there mindset, and watch that that same subtle uh, deception doesn't come, they're on about maintaining our life. I believe we have a big advantage here. There's something about the spirit of this place that is, uh, is really great. And do you know, I, I thought about it just um, last night. I think it's really helpful that we own virtually nothing, do we? We don't own this building. You know, there's just minimal that we own. We, we are very minimalist. And you know what? That's a good thing. 
We don't become attached to it. We haven't got a lot to be attached to, have we? <laughs> that is really good. And hearing like, that's just such joy to hear what Bernie shared before of someone who's had a negative experience at church but he got years ago as a kid got flogged for making noise in church so that just excluded him whatever the message that to come and see our warm welcoming laid back nature oh please keep this up please keep this up please oh you will because it's in your DNA it's why you're here so we've got that but but what can we do to ensure as we lead into the year of um, discernment that we, we we don't succumb and we continue in this spirit let me just share a few things one I believe it's important that we maintain a growth mindset not a maintenance mindset a growth. Let's just assume that we're not where we're meant to be. And and do you know what? One of my illustrations. I was going to say, uh, we need to. This is why. Okay, we haven't got enough children here to sustain a children's ministry. But that's why um, uh, people have lovingly and generously donated all the stuff in the back room, all the table, the stuff there. That says uh, that says children are welcome here. That's just one side of maintaining a growth mindset. Not as assume well, we can't. Let's take our focus away from there. That says that. Another one, until recently, in this illustration I've realised, I looked at this morning's not working. I was going to say, that's why we always have had far more chairs than we need here. It's important to have empty chairs because that reminds us that there's more, there's room for more. Except when I looked out halfway through the first song and found people struggling to find a chair, I thought, we've got to work on this. So I assure you, before next week, there'll be a couple more rows of chairs down the back there. We'll, we'll make it happen. I'm serious. We have to keep that mindset because you can see what happens, don't you? Oh, we're just, there's more people. That's great. That's great. Let's make room for more. We need to keep a growth mindset, not a maintenance mindset. We need in the spirit of Isaiah to sing out, for Zion's sake I will not be silent. In other words, whenever, it doesn't matter where, whether a peace Christian community-sized church or a Hillsong child-sized church or anywhere in between, while there are people in our communities who are potentially leading into an eternity without Jesus, whenever that happens, no matter what size our church is or what we're doing, there's more work to be done. There's more work to be done. So let's keep a growth mindset. In other words, not maintaining what we've done. One, one, um, one pastor said to me recently, I was ashamed, Mark, I did an audit of our budget, and I found out that about 95% of our budget was on maintaining all we had, maintaining buildings and maintaining this and maintaining that and that and very little on mission. You know, there, and I'll be, I'll be honest with you, there are times where I think it'd be nice if we had our own building, you'd have to worry about all those sort of things and that, but let's see what's the gift in this to us. We are where we are, what's the gift in this? Let's maintain a growth mindset. Secondly, let's maintain a kingdom-oriented mindset, not a church-oriented mindset. What do I mean by that? Put it simply, is this. Church-oriented people, the mindset is trying to get people into the church. Kingdom-oriented mindset is taking the church to the world. We need a kingdom oriented mind. Please don't misunderstand. You invite, continue. I love it that you're inviting people here. Continue to do that. I don't want you to not invite people to church. Please do. But you understand what I'm saying. The underlying mindset is in doing that, we are not trying to grow the church because that's Jesus' job. He said, on this rock, I will build my church. He didn't call us to build the church. He called us to go and make disciples. In other words, bring more of his kingdom to the word, world. And when that happens, he will take care of it. He will build his church. So our kingdom-oriented mindset, not a church one, we're not trying to get people into the church. We're trying to take the church to the world. Church-oriented people worry that the world might change the church. Kingdom-oriented people work to see the church change the world. 
Let's maintain a kingdom-oriented mindset. Se thirdly, maintain an open mindset, not a closed mindset. What do I mean by this? We need not... Let's be open. Uh, let me give you an example. I believe, I understand, I have a greater revelation of God now than I had a few years ago, a few years before that, and a few years before that. In fact, there's things I agree with now that I didn't agree with years ago. And there's things that I agree with years ago that I don't sit with me now. And that's part of growth. How we do that is it's okay to listen to others. As you know, there's so much theological divide and difference in the body of Christ, but we need to be afraid of that. It's okay to listen to others who think and believe differently you, to you. It doesn't mean that you might embrace all that they believe, but your own understanding might grow. It may bring fresh revelation to you, what you believe to be God's revelation in the Word. So let's stay open. Because what happens once we close our mind, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. And it's about protecting what we have rather than being open to the fresh revelation of the Spirit. The Lord has yet more light and truth to break forth from his word. And do you know what? He often uses people you least expect to do it. God can speak through anyone in any way. I remember hearing a pastor tell me, this is some time ago, um, he, uh, he was still at theological college and, um, and uh, one of his professors there was very, very, um, very stern and gave very strong feedback on the quality of preaching and everything like that. And, it was its, and, and he tells he was just back he, from, from mission, he had no sleep or everything like that and he was up to, supposed to preach at this youth rally. And um, he looked out and, oh, here's Professor so-and-so in the congregation. And he thought, oh, no. He said, it was the worst sermon I'd ever preached. I, I was tired. I stuttered. I couldn't string words together. I was just, he said it was the worst sermon. But at the end of it, I felt God say, give a call to come and receive Jesus. And I did. And he said, and 13 young people came and gave their lives to the Lord in spite of that. And um, the next thing he sees Professor so-and-so coming towards him and, and he said to him, well, we know from scripture that the Lord can speak through the jawbone of an ass and he certainly did tonight. <laughs> God can speak through anyone in any way. So, yes. So maintain an open mindset. And finally, maintain a step out in faith mindset rather than a play it safe mindset whatever the lord reveals to us i can assure you it will be involve a faith step now i'm not here talking about foolishly running ahead of the lord in human enthusiasm we've got to be wise but there are times when we have to prayerfully take a step of faith and not have all our ducks lined up before we do, but trust that if we really believe he is revealing that to us, he will provide. Five years ago, you might remember when we first moved here and then when we first moved to Morning, um, Health Force Church was in the... Uh, afternoon and they were really we were just contributing to the, their rent and at the end of 2013 th they were not going to continue as a church and said do we want to take it over that i don't know whether those of you here at the time remember that was a big step of faith because the funds at the time didn't say we could afford to do that but we all didn't we had a, those of us here had a sense this was a step of faith we were, had to take and god is faithful we're still here five years later to god be the glory i'm using that as just an example but what he may reveal may be stuff that does our heads in and that's where where we really believe god has spoken it may be a step of faith not to play it safe 
So friends, let's, as we move into this exciting year, I'm really excited about this year. As we take time, Lord, it's not just business as usual, but what is the part that you are calling PCC to play, not only what we see now, but in the future? You know, what the Lord revealed, we may not fully see what may be revealed. But it's about being obedient, not just the business as usual, play it safe mindset. But let's remember we are guided and inspired by the radical, inclusive love of Jesus into a world that is crying out for an experience of grace and hope and purpose and joy and supernatural reality that they're not finding. You know, I think, I, I, I actually, my take is more people are open now than ever before because they're seeing the self-help stuff, the self-fulfillment stuff, the me stuff, the materialism stuff isn't bringing the joy and hope and peace and purpose that we all know it wouldn't. And all of the things, and I've said this before, all of the institutions that we've put faith in before, our financial, our political, and all the others, uh, are not as our, our defence, our security, is not as secure as it once was. This is a great opportunity, isn't it, to share in word or deed that our hope and our assurance and our peace is not dependent on any of these things but rather the sure and certain hope that there is in the God who revealed himself in Jesus. Let's move forward with that mindset. Amen.